and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, thank you for our great uh, panelists today, experts on CRA and experience in open source, of course. Um, yeah, so we've gone through a couple of great presentations, so thank you for, for those, Kieran and Javier. It's a great place for, you know, starting the, the discussion and, and having this. So uh, I would like first that if you can introduce each of you, uh, Mirko, you first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, I'm Mirko Böhm. I work for Linux Foundation Europe. I do community development and I'm engaged in um, open source in Europe for two and a half decades, roughly. Um, I participated in, in two key studies at the EU, one on the interaction of open source and standards development and one on the economic impact of open source in Europe. So i um, really happy that we can discuss the outstanding issues of the CIA today. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Beatriz Benitez. I'm a lawyer. I'm a specialized in uh, new technologies, and in particular in open source and also in intellectual property. And it's an honor to, to be here with, with, with you of all this afternoon. Thank you. Um, and so I work for the Eclipse Foundation. I work on public policy for the Eclipse Foundation, where I sort of look at the interaction between open source and policy. Cybersecurity is one of them, but we can think of competition. What's the role of open source in competition? We can think of data, of the software development, industrial policies, uh, international relation, everything. Great, thank you. I'm James from Red Hat. I'm Director for Public Affairs for the EMEA region. Um, I just want to thank, uh, in particular, OFE for this capital series, previously called the Troika series. And what it was doing was um, every six months, the rotational mm. EU presidency. Uh, we tend to spend our time in Brussels and the EU bubble. And it's absolutely critical to reach out to the capitals and connect uh, the open source community but also um, the, the, the national government. And very often as open source, we don't have um, the kinds of resources you expect in proprietary. So we really cannot have people in all, all these various places, at least from a legal policy perspective. So the, the, these interconnects are really, really uh, important. And again, also a special shout out for Javier and the, 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 the Spanish presidency. I'm not just saying that because you're in the room, um, <laughs> but, uh, but also um, you know, that you have been very collaborative, very accessible. Um, and very keen to protect uh, the, 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 what we call open innovation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, for all of these introductions. Um, um, so to start, to start with something, um, so one, of, one of probably the, of the very first questions that I would like to go with is, OK, we had an original text a few months ago. Now we have this, this new text that was leaked. Um, so first of all, uh, can, you, can you elaborate a bit or, OK, what, what is this bringing to the conversation now? Because the original text was really kind of uh, going to the basic foundations of open source, like, okay, open source may not work anymore with this specific law if this goes as it is. So what have we learned now? What, what, what are the new advances that we see? And basically, what, is, what do you see that may make sense as, you know, start extra discussions here? So, Mirko, you want to start? Sure. Um, first of all, um, and I'm also not saying this just because Harry is here. Um, I think we need to give the, the Commission and the other EU parties involved a bit more credit. Um, because by having the courage to put the CRA out there with all the flaws it initially had, it did open uh, a floodgate of discussions. And it also created a lot of motivation in our community to participate and say, wait, this is not right. And um, I, I, my guess is that was partially intended. Um, so. Um, what I'm trying to say in, in this context is in, in this year that we have been debating on the COA, we've made a ton of progress. Uh, we've clarified a lot of questions. Um, we see, for example, um, the initial way how open source software was almost circumscribed in the text, more or less normalizing on the well-accepted definitions of what free and open source software is, which I find is a great improvement. Um, we see a, a much deeper understanding in the text now of how the difference um, between commercial actors uh, working, bringing products towards the consumers um, and, and the collaborative development processes that develop foundational blocks upstream, um, how they play together and, and, and how they have different roles. And this is what we now see in the text reflected, possibly in the law for the first time, um, which I also think is a great improvement. So maybe one thing that I take away from this is maybe you should have started talking and 
getting engaged a little bit earlier than we could have, so that of many, of many of these issues, um, uh, before they became part of the, the ready-made text, and maybe this is for us, I can say, for Linux Nation Europe, that's one of the key goals from, from the COA process is to say, next time, we would like to provide our advice earlier. And that's, that would be great. Would you, would you say this is a problem of open source communities in general? Like what you said before, right, James? Like, okay, we need to get together and, and do something, and there is no much money involved as if compared in other industries. A bit too much hindsight from my perspective. Um, there are a lot of ongoing legislative initiatives in the EU, and, and you cannot regulate the ICT ecosystem today without touching open source mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. um, as we've seen in the numbers, it's, it's everywhere. It's um, Every commercial product is built on this foundation, and we know it's the most efficient way to develop software. Um, and, and so, yes and no. So mm -hmm. yes, we could have been engaged more, we can be established more strongly, um, but maybe we all need to learn, including the parties on the EC side, and we are very happy to provide our advice. Well, thank you, uh, Javier, if you want to jump <laughs> in the conversation at any time, just <laughs> take a microphone. <laughs> I mean, anyone indeed in the conversation, so this is an open discussion now. Yeah, do, you have, do we have a microphone now? I don't know. Uh, can we have a microphone? There is even a yeah, perfect. Well, thank you. Maybe we can bring yeah. it here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one, one small point, uh, which I really should have mentioned before. The work is not done when uh, the regulation is published. Uh, the work just starts because uh, then you have the, the guides and you have the policies of the market surveillance authorities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and upon these guides, and upon, uh, th these can correct many deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So, and upon these guides, and upon these experiences, and upon this uh, a key of administrative criteria, uh, the next law will be built upon. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. uh, don't stop lobbying, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let, let's enter more, thank you, Javier. Let, let's enter more batteries into technicalities, perhaps. So, okay, what, what are the yeah, from, changes? Yeah, from the legal perspective, yes. yeah, I, I will say. Well, um, I read, we read the, the, the text and both both amendments, the, the Commission one and the Parliament one. Of course, there's an improvement. I think we can see the open source community there, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. Um, we have seen that uh, has been introduced a new role uh, that Kieran, uh, Kieran uh, said before, the steward. Um, okay, but who, who will be the steward? Because we know it will be the foundations, but also the public administrations, universities may fall within this, this, this definition. And also, I mean, we, this will be a concern uh, for them and and is the way is the way we feel. I mean, I feel it with my with my clients. Um, the other the other aspect that I think is important is just to be aware that the open source community is really heterogeneous, and we we cannot talk about uh, steward or no steward projects because I think it's not it's not the reality. Um, and then just to to go and, and step uh, further, we have the the concept of the collaborative development mm -hmm. that is just you no know, complex. Just to understand who who will be um, within this definition, because there's uh, a lot of open source projects that are seeded, for example, uh, through corporate, administrative, uh, academic. Um, contributors and are not, uh, there's not uh, collaboration at, at that stage. So yeah, we, we, we need to clarify and, and we need to, to think a little bit more about how we are going to interpret these concepts and how they're going to be applicable to these organizations so they can know and, and assume that they will need to afford uh, and and they will need to um, yeah t to address uh, some resources that maybe 
they, they, I mean, they, they don't have, they, they haven't uh, thought at, at the moment. So I think it is, it is important. Just it's an improvement, of mm -hmm, course. Mm -hmm. But, but I think, as I said, uh, I think we will need to clarify and we will need to analyze a little bit more. So there's certainty in in the text, and that's that's what can I say with this with this version. Uh, a quick question then. Uh, so my background is in academia. So what would be the impact for you know European Union is telling you, oh, you need to produce open source because this is open science. Good. So then I'm prototyping things. Da, 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 da. Uh, so then I serve something as open source, but I am a, you know a professor at the university or PhD student or so. But then I decide, okay, this might be good for create a product, and then I go commercial. So what is what? What do you think might be, you know, the the burdens of the difficulties of all of this with the CRA as it is now? Perhaps the definition of software um, collaborative development, the mm -hmm. definition of a steward too. Well, as an as an individual, if if you are an an academic, you you will need to make available to a market the product. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's like the commercial the commercial point of view. Uh, from the other point of view, that that's excluded. That's what what we we talk about before. Uh, I think we'll be exempt of the of the obligations mm -hmm. if we are not. I mean, because cannot be every time considered as as a collaborative development. If you are just one one mm -hmm. researcher, <laughs> researcher, of course, makes sense. Uh, for you to be exempt of, of these obligations, mm -hmm. and that's we want to. I mean, if not, will be will be. I mean, hint the that's your question. It will hint oh. the, the innovation. Do we have the microphone? <laughs> it, is, it is related to your comment because in many cases we in the academia work with companies and they can sure. pay us yeah. more than that. Mm -hmm. That could be considered that we are marketing our services as producers of software. Mm -hmm. In many cases, companies cannot do that. That's why they hire us. Mm -hmm. From that point of view, we are economic actors. Mm -hmm. so the definition, as I saw there, is not clear at all. No. We are not covered by the law. No. Which means I need to do some kind of liability study within my university no, or something before not. getting money from a company. That doesn't make a lot of sense, per se. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I would I'm like sure. to add something yeah. without like totally uh, hogging the discussion. But <laughs> um, that's something that really. I still worry a lot in the current text of the series. We're talking a lot about the nature of the actors. Is that a commercial actor? Is, is that mm -hmm. a university, when the university does something like that, are like a paid research project, is that getting commercial? My problem with that is that in, in our world of software, the same actor does actions of very different nature. Um, we, we think it is really laudable if a, if a company hires a kernel maintainer and basically gives them free reign to contribute to Linux kernel. Mm -hmm. So you have a commercial entity, no question. But the act that the person is doing is charitable in a way. So it's like it, it, it's given away for free and the company probably gains some reputation out of that or other, other benefits. But um, the same company also brings products into the market. So for me, it's not a question of who the actor is. We cannot cl like classify the actor as such with all the, the, the actions that they're doing. The individual actions have a different nature. And that's something that I find very difficult to describe in a text. It's not reflected. Um, but I would really like to, to have the understanding that if somebody contributes code upstream into a collaboratively developed project, it doesn't matter if that person is employed or not. It's a, like a non-profit charitable act. If the same company introduces a product to the market, commercial, all the obligations apply. And that's something that I would really like to see. Maybe we can do this in revision two. Um, so it's the act, not the actor, that count on um, in, in, in terms of the obligations from my perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, sorry for that now. Maybe the others can speak. No, yeah, so um, <laughs> let, me, let me go to James. And so sorry about that. Uh, because he mentioned, well, we have developers. That, so we are hiring developers to work on different open source projects. So what would be the specifically your point of view from, from Red Hat perspective, as basically you are doing that, right? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So Beatrice, I mentioned heterogeneity. Um, and also, uh, Tom asked about um, 
so the global commons and the kinds of requirements that need mm -hmm. to be adhered to. Uh, because Thomas said that I looked like uh, a Spaniard, it's the nicest thing anyone's said to me for a long time. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give him a shout out. But your, your question is, is really about where Red Hat is in the top left-hand corner of, of this diagram. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we, we've had a product security team for over 20 years. Um, so we have these hardened processes to, to ensure um, the highest grade of cybersecurity in the open source world. We do backporting, we, we're, we're a, a long established steward, maintainer in multiple, multiple projects. Um, but also what I think is interesting is uh, Mirko from Linux, uh, there was a, a couple of studies that came out, and one which I, sorry, I just had to quickly Google to see what, what was happening. Um, it says that uh, of the survey, 75% um, of those surveyed who are contributing upstream are not from the IT world. Mm -hmm. So the point about heterogeneity, and I think that comes back to your question about how Red Hat sees this, is that you know, we kind of federate that risk uh, with our customers. So we're in 100% of the banks, telcos, airlines, mm -hmm. all member states. We want to build hardened, secure infrastructure. Um, and we do that together. So a rising tide raises all boats. And those kinds of requirements are, are, are in, this, in the CRA. And I think one of the, the, the concerns we would have is the possible duplicative nature of the CRA, where uh, we are doing the common criteria at the highest possible level, and then we have to do a CE mark. But I must say, in all the annex parts of the, the regulation and where it pertains to in-scope open source, I think there's been huge improvements. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it going from the vulnerability disclosure bit um, to the you know no known vulnerabilities, uh, you know risk management. Um, I think that's that's there's there's some really good improvements, and I'd say that the in, in closing, the the importance of avoiding reinventing the wheel in in and ensuring that when companies are contributing upstream and they, or or they're deploying a commercial, um, you know hardened enterprise solution, that when they're doing uh, when they have to because their customers ask for it. Um, a common criteria or what have you, that that's, there's, there's mutual recognition, so they don't have to. And I, and I understand have you, that's the, that, that is understood in, in the text, and that's where the, the, the EU wants this to head. They want to recognize the importance of open source, they want to protect open innovation, and they don't want to lumber all those uh, organizations which are increasingly contributing with extra duplicative, and if I may say quite costly, requirements when they're already in the business of delivering um, secure open source. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and so the, I, now I have a question for you, which is okay. So, um, so the role of open source foundations have been a, traditionally to you know protect developers somehow from you know IP attacks at the very beginning. Um, now it's kind of an umbrella to perhaps have innovation, move forward, have a you know homogeneous way of working, um, neutral place for corporations to to play with software to produce things, right? Uh, so now, what, what, where do you see the role of foundations, and specifically the Eclipse Foundation, where you work at? You mean in terms of the CRA, or? Yes, I mean the, this, this concept of a steward, so maybe you can elaborate there. Yeah, so it's, it, it's complicated because the, the text is, it's a leak, right? Yes. So as you said, I can only comment on the leak since the information maybe is, is do confidential, you, but. <laughs> do, you mind, do you mind yeah. doing a really brief introduction to the leak document, because we've yeah, been sure. mentioning this, but maybe the rest of the audience. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, uh, your, your first question on this was, uh, was, was a very good one in the sense that uh, the two versions of the text, so the original version uh, and, and the last version have something in common. They're both very complicated. And okay. if <laughs> you thought that the presentation made by Karen and Javier was complex, it was one of the clearest, both of them mm. very clear, explaining exactly what it is and the other presentation I've heard on this are far more complex than I've heard that, that, that what I've heard today. Mm -hmm. the, the problem of the first one, the one of the commission, is that it was not looking at open source so much. They were trying to regulate something, open source was in the way, they solved the problem, that's it. What the other one, so the new one, the leak, the one that no one has seen apparently, uh, <laughs> uh, is doing is actually looking at what is existing in open source. Mm -hmm. In open source, you have different roles. You have different uh, people doing different things. You mentioned mm -hmm. uh, foundations. What you've described is pretty much what foundations are doing. And what's good about the, this, this new text is that there is an understanding that 
open source foundations are not distributors, they're not manufacturers, we don't hire developers in order to develop open source software. We're here to help companies gathering or individual gathering together in order to develop something. And that's extremely different from just distributing or manufacturing because there are things that you cannot do. If we have to develop patches as a foundation, we cannot do that. That's not our role. That's not our, the community has to do it. It would be weird for a foundation to just step in and say, no, no, we have to modify the software that way. That's way better in order to regulate or in order to uh, comply with regulations. That's not our role. We don't want to step into this so much. We want to help mm. into improving security through processes, and that's what the, the obligations of this new leak that no one has seen, again, um, is about building processes. So Steward would have those obligations. Now I think the challenge to enter into maybe a bit further to than, than what you asked of, of, of this new text is the obligation of the steward, right? Uh, I, I see them as, as, as being two things. Uh, on one hand, you have to develop a process. On the other hand, you have to report. The problem is that for, and I, 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 we need to be honest on this, you have different type of foundation. It's very heterogeneous, mm. sorry. It's, it's very different, various. Mm. There is a diversity there. And, and it, it would be very, difficult to apply the same obligations and the same requirements to a foundation that only have volunteers with very small budget and then a market civilian authority come on them and say, no, your process is not good enough and then a volunteer has to work his whole weekends, like the next 10 weekends so that it can build a process that a market civilian authority would finally be happy with. So there is this problem as well. Can we ask small foundations the same thing that very mm -hmm. big foundations mm -hmm. do? And that's, that's something hard. Should we build standards? Should we build process? Is the role of a market civilian authority only to sort of tell us, you should do this, it's not good, or help us into building those processes that they want us to have and the CRA want us mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. And then there is the conversation on collaborative development that you've mm -hmm. started, and I think uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's even oh. more another, another, yeah, cool. another question. Go ahead. Yeah. I can only underline that. So um, I was involved in the KD project. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> it's one of the, well, most original European free software projects. Mm -hmm. Um, after some time, the initial 10 contributors came together and we founded a registered association. We applied at the, uh, the, the registers in Germany, we applied for charitable status. It took a couple of years. We got it. Um, the organization receives regular donations through a membership program. Very small. Can pay for one and a half staff, basically, a bit more today. Um, and, and I'm saying this and I'm describing it this way because that's what characterizes our open source ecosystem in Europe. We don't only have large foundations and big business. Um, we, we have a whole network of, of small, found, uh, for small communities that are very much volunteer driven, very specialized, sometimes a bit obscure. You don't even realize that they're there, but you're using their software all the time. But there's another aspect to this, and this is really interesting when it comes to European innovation. I meet my friends from this community today in every business I worked in, in, in every community that has further developed. There are engineering managers, there are architects for European products. So these communities are incubators of knowledge of our best software engineers. I'm convinced that that's true because they have the most experience to work in a diverse, difficult environment and produce great software as volunteers or students, and then they grow into the industry. And this is my biggest fear with the obligations that, are we, that we push onto, let's say, incorporated open source communities, is that if they're still volunteer driven, it's going to be a little barrier for these people to invest a lot of time. And it's a very sensitive and fragile ecosystem. Like you touch it, it goes whoop, and then <laughs> and it just disappears. So we need to foster this and we need to protect it. This is actually something, the policy decision we need to make in Europe is do we tolerate this? Yeah. Because they're the weird people, or do we like say, oh, it's a neutral, it's okay? Or is it really something that drives us and builds our European ecosystem? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm leaning towards this is really an, an important <coughs> contribution, but then we need to not just let it live, we need to actually encourage it. And, and that's what we're currently not yet doing. Yeah. So that would be the thought that we need to develop. Yeah. Yeah. Really absent. In it. Even, even more when uh, there are countries as Spain where the percentage of small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. is basically higher than if compared to the rest of Europe. And then of course, if compared to, to the US, so it's how can we compete, right? And me being the owner of one of these small 
company. James, you <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to just again talk a bit more about that diagram. No. Um, and since I'm an honorary Spaniard now, um, you know, there was Goya, there's <laughs> Vasquez, there's Dali, Picasso, and now Javier. Um, so, <laughs> so I, you know, it, it was really helpful. I've been thinking about this is that, you know, a company like Red Hat is not in just one of those boxes. It's in multiple boxes. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why I'm making this comment is because you, you, you've spurred this thought in my head is that if you are expected or you innovate and you continue to do certain things which perhaps um, typically a foundation wouldn't be doing, yeah. um, then what you are in inadvertently doing is you are painting yourself further into the left-hand corner, right? And I think the, the point that uh, is, 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 is you're doing a lot of great work in the automotive world where you have the mo automotives coming together, they're collaborating, they're sharing code, and they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're agreeing with each other. And Moko, you even much more knowledgeable than I am, having been a former uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, guy, but <laughs> it, it is that, if I understand correctly, the, the differentiator it, it, when you buy a car is not necessarily whether it has, you know, best possible braking system. Um, that is open source, so the, the concept mm -hmm. or the wish is to kind of abstract that out, and then you differentiate above it. So again, if, if for example, these rather risk-averse lawyers and these in incredible companies fear that they might, by collaborating in Eclipse or Linux or others, suddenly find themselves up in the top left-hand corner. It's possible, correct me if I'm wrong, that they might, put, sorry, forgive the pun, put the brakes on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I just want to compliment this. I think that what, it, what James just said is the center of this is in the new text, the new leak, is the way collaborative development is defined. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way collaborative development is defined, the first two sentences that no one has seen is okay, and then the last sentence says when there is one entity exercising control, then it's not collaborative development. Mm -hmm. The problem is that exercising control when it comes to open source is a bit of a strange element, right? What does it mean? Is a committer the one exercising control? Is no one exercising control because of the transparency, vendor neutrality, and meritocratic principle that we apply to all our projects in Eclipse? Mm -hmm. No one is doing it. If there is two committers and then one disappeared, then it becomes a single vendor project despite the, all the things. So what the, what's, what is exercising control of one single entity? Can we be under the governance of a steward mm -hmm. and have one entity exercising control? I don't believe that's the case. I've heard people and colleagues saying the complete opposite. The text at the moment with this specific aspect is not clear, mm -hmm. and that would lead to what James just said. We go to Linux Foundation, to Eclipse Foundation, to Apache Foundation. We think we're doing collaborative development, but because all of a sudden, exercising control is a weird one, then the Market Civilian Authority of Sweden is telling me, no, now you're a single vendor. And that's not okay, because mm -hmm. that is killing the sole idea of having stewards, despite the fact that yeah. the text was trying to define steward to help the open source community, and that could be counterproductive. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mirko, and then we had a question. So, so two comments on this. Um, so one, um, I see this as a homework for the open source community as well. Yeah, so the um, commission, let's say that that concept of the open source steward goes in mm -hmm. and, and creates two separate operators, commercial businesses and people, entities that care about open source projects. Mm -hmm. Then it's up to us to actually say, we adapt our governance, our the way we run the projects, the transparency we apply, so that it perfectly fits the steward uh, definition. It's a give and take on this. So it is actually something I have told our communities a lot is, for now, we can try to influence the text, but once the text is there, we need to start learning to live in the new environment. And mm -hmm. not all of that is just necessarily bad. A lot of it is also impetus for innovation. For example, the question of what does open governance mean um, is, is one of these un, like blurry areas for us. <laughs> it's kind of a bit embarrassing that we, in 2023, are not able to say in one sentence what open governance means. And what the commission currently does is it forces us to come to terms. It circumscribes it and says, no, you prove it. Mm -hmm. was the one comment. The other comment is, um, software development today is bidirectional. It is like take components, integrate them further onto the cons consumer, uses them, and at the same time um, to make sure these components exist, employ developers and contribute there in that direction. And this change in direction, um, until now in our perception, is a firewall for, for liability, for responsibility, etc. Why? 
because the communities that release the software, they don't have a relationship with their users. The users decide to use the software. It's their sole authority. They don't pay for it, and they decide it's a one-sided action. And, and that's why we say, if I make a mistake, and that's where the car maker example comes in, like I make a mistake and, and I introduce a bug, and somebody else uses that software, and now the brakes don't work. Um, they cannot construe a liability to me because I didn't give them the software, they didn't pay me for it, I released it into the comments, and they made the call to use it. This is this firewall aspect of the, uh, the upstream, the open comments. And I would really like this thought to be explicitly established. This is one-sided action. If I, as a manufacturer of a product, decide to use an upstream project, I have to be aware that I bear the sole responsibility for that decision. I cannot make anybody else responsible for the mm -hmm. cybersecurity vulnerabilities, the product defects that I introduce in my product. Unfortunately, until now, we kind of interpret this into the text, also in the product liability directive, but this is something that I wish, really wish, that the EU would explicitly put into the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had, we had, let's go for the question. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, to the panel, as someone that has found himself in all the different quadrants of the diagram that <laughs> Javier showed uh, before, um, I, it, it's heartwarming to see that the current text is better than the initial text, but quite frankly, that doesn't seem to be enough just yet. And I'm thinking specifically about the right-hand side of the quadrant, so the anarchist, uh, zero governance uh, kind of uh, projects. Mm -hmm. And the series seems to place a bad incentive for these projects to stop their maturity process, in a sense, because some of the problems that open source communities have had are precisely like lack of governance, lack of diversity, and uh, lack of resources, lack of direction, etc. So um, then my question would be for the panel, how can the interests of those projects be better represented during the negotiations and so on, so that uh, we can come up with solutions to these problems? Who would like to go? I love the question. No, anyone? Go for it. I, I, it's, <laughs> it, it's both a, a policy question and a democratic <laughs> question. Uh, because the question is, can anarchists, because it was the symbol on the thing, actually get together into discussing with policymakers, or do, don't they want to do it? And, and are they still anarchists? Right. <laughs> but also, is, is it, can, how, what is the solution of the policymakers in order to know how to interact with groups of people that are on purpose not organized or not yet organized because that's just how it is. I think that's a very big challenge and I think that's what Mirko was, was, was going about saying maybe we need to get together and, and discuss about what is open governance as well so that we can actually go back to policymakers and say all together whatever you believe in that's, that is the way we see open governance all together. That's not going to be easy. Now, the, the thing of maturity of projects, I, with the last text, with the steward thing inside, I cannot agree and disagree at the same time because the obligations, if you have a project under the governance of a steward that is for collaborative development, it doesn't mean that a manufacturer would have obligations, only the steward has the obligation to develop processes. Mm -hmm. If the text as the steward goes as it is, it would be a problem with the small, for the smaller stewards, as I mentioned before, because having a process is not easy, and if the Spanish Market Civilians Authority comes at you and saying, your process is not good enough, what are they gonna do? Um, but it's, it would, I think, my understanding as it is, is that it would be wrong to believe that the simple fact that you become bigger and you create a steward or a foundation would make the manufacturer responsible. No, it would make the steward responsible to build a process that the manufacturers might want or not want or be able or not be able to follow. But in the end, there is no real obligation for the manufacturer that has developed. But then, mm -hmm. if it's really a big project, then the obligation falls because if it's a project that is controlled by one, mm -hmm. that's, that's another thing. So it's, that's for the AOSP of that word, that would, that the, 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 the sort of, not punishment, but I, that's how to take it, frankly, for an open source project. Uh, having to comply with such requirement on the design of an open source component, that's kind of a punishment considering that you give to the world for free. Um, that's, yeah. that's a long answer to a short question, sorry. I'll make it even longer. Um, <laughs> we have to kind of also <laughs> keep in mind how, how open source projects evolve and what the role of this like anarchic, um, individually driven, highly uh, decentralized uh, part of our community is. 
um, because we tend to focus on the big projects. The big projects, they have all established themselves by, uh, quite some time ago, developed proper governance structures, acquired corporate supporters that are funding them on a regular basis. I speak for the project of the Linux Foundation as well. Um, but how did it start? How did Linux start? It was one student from Finland, right? So individual anarchist developer <laughs> releasing the first version of the software. Um, and that's the role of this, the right side of the, of the di diagram. Those are the actual innovators. The big projects, they introduce a technology. They develop it to maturity. But the next competitor to this project is not going to come from the big project. It's going to be one or two or ten different anarchists <laughs> throwing out projects. And one or two of these projects may actually grow to be a small, viable community. Then one turns out to be the next big thing. I mean, mm -hmm. we've seen lots of projects like this. Mm -hmm. So we need to be, I think, extra careful to not throw this part of the community out with the, with yeah. the bathwater, mm -hmm. but also allow them to take this transition. Because these projects today, they're only successful because they made a transition from one anarchist, 10 anarchists, registered association that is charitable, big business. Mm -hmm. right? And um, these are the, the sensibilities that we have in the text. So you can really inhibit something from happening. And this was hurt mm -hmm. Europe, because we are the people that actually develop the software in Europe. Many of the projects develop here. And we need to further and encourage that. So. Yeah, I'm not going to make the case for, for anarchy, but <laughs> um, 1936, Catalonia, things work quite well. Also, I, I'm also Belgian for 500 plus days. We didn't have a government. Everything was actually quite cushy. But uh, that aside, uh, I think the, 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 the risk I think Boko is going at is the, the re introduction of swim lanes in how the ecosystem works. And it's not a bad thing um, to have folks right out there. And I mean, we have half our engineering uh, upstream, and they're doing development in perhaps projects which are related to, to downstream products, but also completely way off the reservation. And that's good. That's great. You know, that's how innovation should should work. So mm -hmm. I think if that, that, that happens, then the, the proverbial baby thrown out with the bathwater is, is, a, is, a, is a risk. <laughs> At the same time, um, we need to address this Wild West um, perception um, and this um, reputation, even, uh, that we mm -hmm. still have. I mean, there's still this FUD, which um, has, was propagated 20-plus years ago, and the ripples are still with us. So I think the CRA can, can help us uh, frame that conversation um, and, and present um, the open source uh, community, also the, the downstream products, in a, in a much more positive, positive light. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity to protect the open innovation, but also you know, en enable and help the community uh, understand better some of these, these concerns and, and perceptions and, and, and help them address them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, let, let's change a bit the context here. So now let's go to daily operations. So we have a law firm, we have open source foundations, we have a for-profit company with big amount of customers, of course. Um, so now it's, it's kind of a quick survey here. So how many of your customers, anonymized, of course, everything, are really worried about the CRA? Are you, are you having questions and, and so on? Oh, maybe Beatriz, you can go with. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of kind of clients, but as I said, we have, for example, universities, public administrations, and of course, there is a concern because they, they, they see this, these new obligations, the, the one that have been leaked as, as an administrative burden and they are worried about how, how I'm going to, to make this process work or maybe I will have the, the enough resources to, mm -hmm. to deal with this. So, well, it's not clear, but of course the, there's like a big red flag <laughs> because mo I mean, most of them they are small projects, mm -hmm. uh, and of course they 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 won't they won't afford the 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 these new processes as the identification, the documentation, the reporting. Then I don't know, so many obligations that are more reasonable. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. true than the ones from the previous text. But of course, I mean, there's not certainty, and I mean, 
we will have the lawyers we will have a lot of work <laughs> just to <laughs> interpret this and try to to i don't know the, i mean assess the client uh but of course uh let's see what happens because i mean the, of course the, the 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 main thing and the main concern from from our point of view from my point of view is that this may be a stopper just to the the open source projects to 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 I mean to develop that's 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 my opinion and that's why why we are seeing in in the in the law firm at the moment at mm -hmm. the girls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. From an open source foundation perspective, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, look, we we've heard it today. Uh, so mm -hmm. what I would say with concur and it's sort of a testimony, and I think it, it would be an, ex an extremely ex sort of tele example. We've heard today the, the problem that you've mentioned uh, just before. Uh, we've heard Javier saying as well before, you know, we don't want to do this because we understand that there would be a burden on companies and on innovation. I will not be able to disclose the name of any company, but we've already had a company coming to us saying, no, sorry, this project, uh, we wanted to open it, not happening because we're too scared of the CRA. Mm -hmm. We understand that and the cost of compliance doing it in-house would be reduced by how many, I don't know, hundred times. Well, if we do it uh, to the open, the cost of compliance explodes to the roof. We don't feel like doing it at the moment. Let's see what's the discussion of the CRA happening. And I mm. think uh, policymakers, and I, I'm pointing out Javier because he, he's the one who mentioned it today, understood this. Um, but that's a, that's a critical reality. Imagine mm -hmm. if we're talking about some of the biggest European companies. We, we are a European uh, foundation, right? So we headquartered in Europe. Most of our uh, um, um, members are European. I think 75% of our members or 70% of our members are European. We're talking about a very big European company that is like, we want to open something so that the whole European ecosystem can benefit from it. And they say, no, we don't want to do it anymore. And that's, that's, uh, that's not a small thing. That's, mm -hmm. And no one can blame them for this. You know, can they can they actually carry the cost that is multiplied by a hundred? Uh, they don't think that they could do it, and I understand them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we actually did a panel at the Open Source Sum Summit Europe in Bilbao a month ago, where we invited, a, 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 we tried to really get like the full spectrum: the Linux kernel community, Python Software Foundation, GitHub, Red Hat, and Ericsson. So we tried to get also a, like a European device maker business on board. Um, we recorded that, we published it, and we wrote a blog post about that that was published two days ago. <laughs> so if you're asking mm -hmm. what are the impressions of a wide range of stakeholders, I can only recommend you go and read that um, because it gives you kind of the in-the-field impression. of Like, now that we read this, now that we analyzed this, why are we scared? Mm -hmm. But there are two things, two takeaways from that, uh, from that panel that I would like to highlight. One is um, somebody highlighted that it was not necessarily a good idea to to add barriers to, to sharing source code. This is how open source became successful. We had very low barriers, so collaboration was very simple and easy and, and straightforward. And now we're adding barriers to that sharing, which is really the, the lowest level um, of the fabric of open source. So barriers to sharing code, we should really be careful with that. And that's why it needs to be clear that the individual committer is not responsible, etc. The other one, um, was to be aware that you can put up a legislation that has clear requirements for when you are compliant, but being compliant does not equate to being secure. Mm -hmm. So um, what we have to keep in mind is that all the processes that the open source ecosystem have developed um, for, of like really responsible disclosure of um, um, making sure fixes get propagated quickly mm -hmm. um, that kind of complements the, the law. And so when, when the standards are being developed, once this, the text is done, we need to make sure that all the processes that we have are merged into what becomes the standard, the, the accepted process, and that we can even improve it on that. Um, so yeah, so these are two impressions. No barriers to sharing code, and um, m make sure that the process is actually working done, not just following the law, but actually <laughs> focusing on compliance. Last and certainly least of all, um, I, I guess in sort of the, the lobbying fraternity of, of many of our customers, and we have mm -hmm. thousands of, of customers, yeah. um, I think the, the awareness of how important open source is to them from a sort of legal policy perspective is pretty small. Um, and uh, it's only when they bump into, almost serendipitously, their engineer um, <laughs> in the corridor, I, I, back at headquarters or, or what have you, there is this what is going on. 
they then realize that not only are they using open source, um, they're also increasingly contributing to open source. So I, I think we, we've, we've seen a kind of shivet, a shift, shivered, that's a pivot and a shift altogether, <laughs> um, towards that uh, awareness. I think the other thing is to, to your question, uh, we also have millions of people around our, our products, this extraordinary mm -hmm. ecosystem. So, you know, we're already sort of fielding questions uh, from, um, from that community, individuals, and so what we will have to do as soon as it's, 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 it's done and dusted, is look at it very um, carefully and produce some kind of FAQ um, as to what this actually uh, means. Um, because I think we are sort of, yeah, we have a, we have, we have a, uh, a role to play uh, as being uh, still the, the world's leading open source solution provider. So that's something which is incumbent. But again, the resources are quite finite. Um, uh, compared with uh, perhaps others. And I think maybe a mm. final final point, if I may, the resources point. I think there's never been a stronger case to, to collaborate. So all those companies out there, uh, the automotives, the banks, and so on, um, I think there's a real opportunity, especially when it comes to the, the 44 standards that need to be developed. They will be involved in those. We need to educate them as to, mm -hmm. hey, what are the open source implications? Uh, the review of the new legislative framework, likewise, some of the notions of how it pertains to open source. Um, and then also finally, there's a whole, whole piece around mutual recognition. What are the standards out there? Or, or what are the certifications out there which you are asking us, customer X, Y, and Z, to do um, that then can be automatically CE marked so that we don't go through a huge extra cost round mm -hmm. when actually the customer ultimately doesn't, doesn't want that. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, um, Adele is, is, in, is in the audience, um, and she's uh, conducting a survey for, for Red Hat to kind of understand better where, where, where customers and partners and, uh, and folks are thinking around uh, Red Hat products, but also open source more generally. So, uh, Adele, if you'll put your, put your... There we go. This lovely lady. So, um, I, I've, I've done my job to, to identify. So, over the, over the <laughs> drinks, it'd uh, be great if you could have a, have a quick chat with her. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, any more thoughts here? We have like uh, 10 minutes left. So I don't know if there are questions that are kind of burning you. Uh, no, I, I would like to come to your, Mirko, to your comment on the difference between uh, who you are and what you do. Because from my point of view, that's quite important. Um, as you said, for instance, uh, even large companies are sharing code just because they want to share or just because, well, they don't care. And that's not really a commercial activity, even if the company is commercial and very big. From my understanding of the current texts, the important thing is who is doing the fact. I mean, if it is a company, it gets liable and all of that. So, but in, in, in open source software and in free software, uh, it's very important to separate both things. But I don't think I don't see that in the in the in the law now, and no intention of that. I mean, no no movement. I'm not 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 hear of anything about that. If that's not fixed, it's very difficult that all the actors behave in their own interest. I mean, mm -hmm. I just say code because I don't care, I just say code because it's, it's not a cost for me, or whatever. Because they are all the time going to think about the liability. And uh, in most companies, that's a big, a big issue. But that happens also for universities. So as I said before, my university is going to start thinking, can I be considered as a marketer of services, for instance, mm -hmm. even if I'm just sharing code because, well, I'm, I'm a professor and I don't care, but maybe the, the university is considered as a marketer, which means they can be liable, and uh, maybe I'm going to be said, Please don't serve code, which goes against the policies of the commission, by the way, <laughs> which is a bit strange, I would say. So maybe we've heard a lot about the concerns and everything that's complicated and, and, and that the world is coming apart. On, <laughs> on this one, I think there's actually a relatively simple fix, and that is to clarify that somebody who like, basically submits a pull request to a project is not responsible under the COA. It is the entity that makes a release of the software. Mm -hmm. um, because that will already clarify that problem. If you know, a corporate software developer offers the integration of a piece of code, the upstream project accepts it. Um, unless the upstream project makes a release, that, that is not like made available. And if it's made available, and that's an open source steward, then it's clear what the responsibility of that community is. So that would be a very concrete suggestion, is to say clarify that it's not the individual developer, no matter if they're employed. It's the entity where this gets integrated that's responsible. Because the individual commit is not an entity in an ICT ecosystem. It's the release of the software. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a very clear way to clarify that, and then that problem is gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
there is another thing that was uh, in a in a text that we've seen or not seen um, is uh, something that would drastically improve the cybersecurity of open source, uh, but not in a negative sense, in the sense that it doesn't bring obligations on, on the least capable actor or the least financial means available actor, is uh, one element that says, if you're using an open source component and you improve its cybersecurity through a patch or whatever, that you have to report back that cybersecurity innovation back to the maintainer. Mm -hmm. I think I've not heard anyone in the open source community ever say that this was a bad uh, element in the CRA. It is not, we have not seen it in the text of the steward thing uh, or the collab development uh, thing, but this is definitely a, a positive uh, element for the open source community mm -hmm. that would help mm -hmm. drastically to improve cybersecurity and it doesn't feel like a regulation or a burden on, on, mm -hmm. on the organization that have the less uh, financial means available. This is also another instance of where we see huge progress in, in the understanding. There was a clause added that it needs to, the patch needs to be made available in a way that it can actually be integrated upstream, license-wise, the license need to fit. Yeah. And uh, yes, that's maybe we should also highlight the good things in this area, and that's definitely one of mm -hmm. the potential real improvements. Right. Would you say this is a, okay, let, let's play evil savocate here, uh, can we say CRA is, a, is an opportunity for open source? What if we play that role? So certainly one of the litmus tests of whether it's a success or not is whether it bolsters upstream <laughs> uh, contribution. Let's see. Um, I mean, all the, all, the, all the indicators, whether it's the sort of the GitHub innovator guide or the Linux researcher, et cetera, the, the, it's all doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, as you'll find out in the next panel, um, there's some really exciting growth in terms of open source. So. If there's a little sort of dip, maybe that's acceptable. Uh, if there's something else that comes afterwards and then there's the next next wave of, of open innovation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if not, then it's then then I think we'll see like we've done with NIST. You know, NIST one, well they had to come back, NIST two, mm -hmm. we'll we'll look, be looking at CRA two. If I may, um Adele is not called Adele, it's Alona, isn't it? Sorry, my bad. And Javier, I think you wanted to come in, you put your hand up, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, not to hog the conversation, but just to make a couple of points. Oh, the camera. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, just to make a couple of points. First, uh, you spoke uh, very eloquently about uh, small organizations and SMEs. Uh, our heart is close to them, and mm. they will get uh, the, the surely a special mention, uh, I think, in the in the final text, uh, mm -hmm. an exemption. Mm -hmm. which uh, is already there, for example, in Nice. It's, uh, it only makes sense. Another, po another point, a larger point, is uh, for definitions. Uh, the, um, uh, this is uh, something that comes up once and again. If I had a, a euro for every time uh, I have got a complaint that oh, in, the, in this law the definition is not good, I'd have, li I'd have like 20 euros or so. <laughs> which is already a lot. Good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, um, that's the problem with laws. The, the map is not the territory. The map has much less detail than the territory. The, ter the, the reality is very granular, and particularly in open source, every specific organization has a specific little model where no, the founder gives them money, and he only monitors it sometimes, and, and uh, we need a quadrant, new quadrant for a specific company. And uh, yes, uh, it's like that. Uh, the, the definitions are often fuzzy, and they have to encompass very, uh, and uh, this has been the case too, for example, in, NIS, in the NIS directive with uh, cloud service providers, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. when NIS one came out, uh, we had a very specific idea of what they would be, and in the end, uh, everyone and their aunt is a, a cloud service provider. And uh, we had to get around redefining the terms within the definition. And uh, I'm sure this will be the case too. But, um, and uh, that's what the guides are there for, for example, in the new legislative framework. And uh, that's what the administrative criteria of the market surveillance authorities are there for. And that's why market surveillance authorities sit together and say, let's have um, common criteria for these things. Mm. And um, uh, so, um, but there's a trade off there. If uh, we make the definition too alambicated, too Byzantine, too long, uh, uh, there are, and the compliance costs can rise. So mm. we cannot. Uh, uh, make the definition too long either. So uh, there, uh, there's no easy solution there. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
<laughs> yep. Oh, take it. So there were, there were a question there. One more question to uh, Beatriz in this case. Um, this is a strictly legal uh, question. There are many open source and free software licenses that end with the software is provided as is without warranty of any kind. How does that interact with the whole CRA and uh, all the obligations and so on? Sure. Um, well, here uh, we, we have seen there's other obligations that the, the steward the steward will need to 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 comply with um, there's not the the requirement of the of the ce uh, certification of the risk analysis whatever now we have uh, other kind of of obligations uh, yeah of course uh, this will i mean th this is a problem because who is going who is going to be responsible if, if I mean, if there's any claim of, of if we have like any problem with the use with the use of the of the software, I mean nowadays with the with this text, this I mean there's not a solution at all. Um, I cannot say what we're going to do. I don't really know what is going to happen. Uh, as far as I know, we, we are going to deal with with the non-liability or the limitation of liability that the open source licenses uh, have nowadays. But for example, there's uh, another another example that we impact with the with the copyleft uh, licenses, with the no surrender, uh, with the no surrender freedoms. Uh, you you can say that, for example. Uh, it says, I'm, I'm doing it by memory, but it says that if you cannot comply with the terms of the obligation or any other obligations, that this will be the, the obligations imposed by the CRA, you cannot convey the, the, the product under that license. So you, can, you cannot, I mean, transfer the license under the GPL, for example, if you are not complying with the with that obligations, so that's uh, other concern. That it, what are we are going to do with this? I mean, that's really important. That's huge for the for, for I mean for the projects from the licensing perspective. I think that's the the most the most important. Of course, the the as is the limitation of liability. That's that's huge. Also, yeah, but. So we'll have to yeah. change our licenses, basically. We'll have to change the whole thing. I hope not. <laughs> think so? <laughs> no way, you know. <laughs> no, that, that's why I think there's, there's the need to work a little bit on this. Because, I mean, there's an impact. There's a legal impact. And, of course, Mirko, you will know better. But, I mean, I think it's necessary just to, to make a, a transactional cost uh, and statutory cost of these obligations just to... I mean, to ensure that, that these kind of organizations that we are talking about can deal with this. And that's, I mean, I think, I, think, I think it's important just to, I mean, to ensure that won't be that impact, that legal impact uh, in a short term. I mean. Mm -hmm. So the, the clauses that you describe are particular to the GPL mm -hmm. with three. Um, but essentially that means that the body of software that is out there under this license may become undistributable. And that's, <laughs> that's certainly not the intended effect. I'm relatively mm -hmm. sure that, that nobody wanted that. But um, that, if that's the case, then we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. Mm. Um, but there's, um, there's kind of a, a medium-term effect here, and that is what should the community do that owns this code? Basically, what we just said is they may not make this code available in Europe if they can't comply with the COA and the licenses. You cannot comply with the COA because you're taking freedoms <laughs> from the user away. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is that either by license or by choice, they will say, well, but then we don't make it available in Europe because we're an open source community. We don't make money anyway. And that's um, sometimes this has been described as like a doomsday scenario, mm -hmm. but I, I'm looking at this from my hat of I have run a community before as an elected representative. And if you have zero money, you have money to pay half a community manager, um, and all of a sudden you have such obligations and you cannot comply with the license, then you will look for a straw that you can pull and say, okay, we'll go this way. And, and this is not an unintended side effect. And 
I think we would be very like, ill-advised as European <laughs> citizens to, to, to let that happen. So mm -hmm. that's definitely something we need to prevent from happening. And yeah, and it would not even increase the level of cybersecurity because yeah. Yeah. They, let's just say they don't make it available uh, in Europe. And mm -hmm. then a developer figured out a way to get access to it. I don't know, a random idea like a VPN, for instance. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then they have access to it, they implement it. And then the only thing they have to do is now to make sure that this component complies with the CRA. Like Javier said before, if you buy a, com a Chinese component with this weird C marking on it, which is not the actual C marking, the only thing you have to do is to make sure that the component is now compliant with their um, uh, safety regulation. Mm -hmm. So in the end, no cybersecurity added and all the burden is in Europe and nowhere else. No, yeah, nothing happened. So does, does this mean that basically we uh, no developers will exist, open source developers will exist in Europe anymore? Let's not end on that kind of note. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so. going overboard. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Look, look, this is a regulation about horizontal resilience. It's not yes. an IP regulation, so mm. I, I don't see that as a as a as a as a you know a secondary effect, and that would mm -hmm. be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. As it stays. Okay. Now, probably last question for today, because now it's been a full hour almost. Um, now that I hear, you know, I, I own this small company called Viterdia, so we have the following situation. Let me know what, what I should do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay, we started in academia. Jesus there and Gregorio were my PhD advisors. So then we decided, okay, we produce this open source technology, formalized open source projects, da, 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 perfect. Then we started to have some companies, you know, expressing interest, like, well, I would like to do this development or this thing, so then this is helping me, so then I'm paying you money. It's not exactly research, but it's research, but it's kind of in between, right? Um, so then after this, we say, okay, now we found the company. Good, perfect. So then we take basically, as everything was open source, GPL version three, we say, okay, we move into, uh, into the uh, testing the market. This is where we were basically at the very beginning. And then you, Javier mentioned, well, uh, small companies will have a certain exemption here, chapter or section or so, mm -hmm. claiming this. Um, so it took us several years to test the market. Now we have certain business running. Um, and now, in the last three, four years, our technology was forked by the Linux Foundation on the one hand, and then they are providing uh, like a SaaS service. I don't know if there's still code on from ours. Um, and then there is a Chinese company, Huawei, that forked the project, and then they started the project called OSS Compass. So where are we in all of this, basically? Because we have, we have our project that we have certain collaborators. We are a, a part of Chaos Community, which is a Linux Foundation project. Um, then we have Linux Foundation that fork the same, their, their own project, and then we have this Chinese company doing this. How do we proceed here? I don't know. I don't even know how to start. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, a it's, a, it's a question for perhaps. Yes. Yeah, so I, I would say. Any like, thoughts? <laughs> so I, I think when, when one particular company a long time ago um, decided to fork uh, at Enterprise Linux, um, <laughs> we came out with unfakeable Linux. They came out with unbreakable Linux. We just doubled down on on contributing upstream. We, that was the sort of the um, the, 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 the the strategic move. Uh, but that's from a, a, a place of some some momentum mm -hmm. um, and, and resource. Uh, you are in a different different environment. Yes. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what the answer is, actually. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> I was thinking how the CRA changes the picture in this case. Mm. Um, I think th this is maybe a good example for how complicated the structures in open source can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because you have contributors, often you have like a foundational piece of software that the business then builds upon, makes commercial versions of it, or provides services, operates it as a service. Um, and we need to really understand what are the roles. Um, you're running a business and it provides a commercial software. It's open source license, but you're as a business, you're commercial. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, and, and that means you are fully responsible under the CRA. Yep. Um, the, the Linux Foundation is probably a steward hope in, in, in this structure. Mm -hmm. We're not selling it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe one, one conclusion here is the CIA will force us to make the roles of the individual actors who are developing, contributing, operating much more explicit. Um, and we have the situation a lot in open source. We have single vendor companies, many of them with the best intentions, many some of them with murky intentions. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm developing my software, I sell commercial licenses to it, but I make an identical version available under an open source license so that the community can use it. Mm -hmm. 
Usually, of course, market penetration, it's reputation, but it's also just a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Still, we're treating as, them as commercial actors, and the CAA will make this explicit. So this idea of the single vendor model, well, we have to rethink it. How, how do you do that in the future? Do you separate those two, make, make one into an openly, collaboratively developed foundation, um, and, and build a commercial model on top? Maybe that's a conclusion here. So the, the CAA is also an opportunity to, to mature as, a, um, as an ecosystem, which has also the downside that some approaches may not work that we were used to. So they, we, we always give this example of the, uh, the, the single person maintainer that <laughs> maintains a crucial piece of software that we're using everywhere. Yeah. Um, we are very endeared to this model. But it may be, may be time to admit that for something that becomes critical infrastructure software, that might be a bit too brittle as a model. So maybe this will force us into a more mature government model for projects that are critical. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity. Um, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater and preventing small projects from emerging, mm -hmm. which is a tight balance. Yeah. So, mm. yeah. yeah my, my first thought there was, okay, we are, okay, of course, Huawei is not going to enter into the market. It's, it's too small, but it's like what you said, Javier, right? So the cybersecurity is, is here. So it's already here. The point is probably at the very beginning until we really understand how this works. Mm -hmm. uh, we are we might be, or other companies in a similar situation, in kind of a disadvantage, competitive disadvantage. So we need to learn how to deal with that. The help of open source foundations would be fundamental. The help of the European Union, of course, mm -hmm. would be uh, fundamental as well to make to make this happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's like a, a labyrinth, right? So it's <laughs> so far trying to, to <laughs> make the puzzle and so on. So any more thoughts here, or I think not. We are close <laughs> to close. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any more questions from the audience? Thoughts, hope, hope this was uh, great for everyone. Good discussion, thank you, our panelists. Thank you for your time and well, thank you all. Thank you.